Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pieter Verstraten. What an awkward and strange beginning of a TEDx talk, isn't it? I almost could hear you ask the question, what on earth is happening here? Is this guy maybe suffering a heart attack? Or might he be one of those patients suffering from young onset dementia? None of that is the case. What I wanted to do is to make you feel what it is like to listen to silence. And I think that that is very important, especially given the loud and talkative times we do live in. We indeed live in loud times. I mean, think about all of the sounds that you encounter when you leave your house in the morning and when you go to your work. The sound of cars, the sound of bicycle brakes, the sound of a train passing by. We do not only live in loud times. I think we also live in talkative times. Times in which we are encouraged to speak up. Times in which we are forced, in a way, to speak up, to use our voice, to raise our voice, to engage in dialogue. We do live in loud and talkative times. And I think that that probably is one of the most important reasons why I so often feel out of place. I have to admit it. I just love it when everything is quiet. Where other persons reload their batteries by going to a party, I just get reduced by sitting alone, by reading a book, by being only by myself in my office space. That is how I reduce my batteries. I just love it when everything is quiet. And if someone would have posed me the question, what would you prefer? To give a TED talk of 18 minutes or to remain silent for three weeks? I immediately would have responded, well, yeah, three weeks of entire silence, of course. Where did my love for silence come from? Where did it originate? Well, I think it kind of has two roots. And the first one, and here they are, is related to my family. I am the proud father of three kids. Cornel, who is 13 years old, Stin, who is 8 years old, and then my youngest son, Rilke, who is 4 years old. And they are really kids. They play and they talk. 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 And sometimes they sleep. So little space for silence where I live. Little space for silence in my house. Please do not get me wrong. I definitely love my kids. I probably love them more than I do love silence. But still, 
they play a role in my love for science. On top of my family, current family situation, I also want you to take back to my own childhood. I was raised in the 80s and the 90s, and when I was a toddler, I often was sick. I suffered frequently from pneumonia. And given the fact that my two parents worked full-time, I often was sent to the house of my grandparents. They owned a little shop in a little village called Snellegem in the neighborhood of Bruges, where my grandfather worked as a tailor. And I still remember quite vividly how my grandfather was sitting on top of his sewing table in this very characteristic crossed-legged position, sewing a costume, sewing a dress, but without ever uttering a single sound. He never spoke a word. I never heard him speaking a word. My experience, my experiences with my silent grandfather kind of were reaffirmed, reconfirmed, when I became a teenager and was sent by my mother to the family of her sisters and brothers. And all of those sisters and brothers, they owned a farm. And so during the summer holidays, what happened was that I found myself on a big hay wagon, harvesting the crop in the midst of the summer. And I still remember, again, very vividly, how I loved the silence that reigned on top of that hay wagon. I think those childhood experiences kind of made me sensitive for silence. They triggered a kind of love for silence, and when I became an educational researcher later on in my life, I immediately kind of became intrigued by the transformative powers of silence in education. And I started to look into journals, I started to explore the literature in order to find examples and traces of this transformative power of silence in education. And I came across a lot of them. I mean, think about the discussions we recently had about the silent schools. Huh? Some years ago, a school in Antwerp decided to abolish the school bell. So, no sound of a school bell announcing the start of the day. The children had to find it out on their own. And what about the French ban on cell phones we recently saw appearing in France? Again, I think this is an example of how teachers, of how directors of school, turn toward silence in order to transform the present into a better future. The transformative powers of silence in education. Being not only an educational researcher, but more in particular, a historian of education, I have also started to explore archives. I have tried to find traces of that transformative power of silence in books, in articles, in archives. And I have to admit it, I have been confronted with a plethora, an abundance of examples, historical examples, that underline and emphasize the transformative powers of silence. I mean, you only have to look at the fifth century before Christ, when a philosopher like Pythagoras, who owned a school and who asked his pupils to remain silent for five entire years before they were allowed to utter a single word, to speak up and to mingle in the dialogue. I mean, imagine yourself. You come to the university, you start your study at KU Leuven, huh? you enter the first bachelor, and the only word which you are allowed to speak is at the end of your second master. We, nowadays, would say that this is a surreal situation. Besides Pythagoras, uh, 
you also could point towards Michel de Montaigne, a humanist philosopher who, at the time when he lived, was not at all pleased with what he called the verbal diarrhea of his colleagues. People just spoke too much. They had to turn down. They had to become quiet. While exploring the history of silence from an educational perspective, I all of a sudden stumbled upon the work of Maria Montessori. And Maria Montessori is a reform educator. She lived at the start of the 20th century and wanted to reform the school along three guiding principles. The first one being that one had to put the child at the center. Not anymore an authoritative teacher could decide what was happening inside the walls of a school. No, the child itself had to become master of its own learning trajectory. So not the child had to be adapted to the school, the school had to adapt itself to the child. And so, for instance, if a child would enter the school with a snail in its hand, then the teacher had to look at the snail and decide to start up a project where biological knowledge, geographical insights and mathematical calculations had to be offered to the child on the basis of that snail. The second guiding principle in order to reform the school for Maria Montessori was that she wanted to get away to abolish what she called the listening school. The 19th century school for Maria Montessori was outdated. It was outdated because what was happening in that school is that children were forced to sit still. They could not utter a single sound because only the, the teacher could speak. The heavy wooden benches, furthermore, prevented the children from moving around freely. And so what Maria Montessori suggested is that the school benches were abolished to get away with the so-called listening school. And then finally, what she also wanted is that the school became an instrument that prepared children for life. The 19th century school was outdated precisely because it was alienated from life. It was alienated from society. So she wanted to reduce the gap between the school and society, the bridge between school and life. At a time when Montessori worked and wrote, the time when she presented her ideas, Western society accelerated. And I think that is definitely important also to take into account. Because Maria Montessori also came up with some very interesting silent exercises. And she used those exercises in order to prepare the children to be able to live a life in that accelerated society. And here on this slide, you can see one of the few pictures that exist of such a silent exercise that took place at the start of the 20th century in a Montessori classroom. What would happen is that Maria Montessori entered the classroom, took a piece of chalk, went to the blackboard and wrote the word silencio, silence, silence, on the blackboard. And this was the sign which meant that all of the children had to become silent. They had to close down their eyes and just listen to all of the sounds that came from outside, inside the classroom. Maria Montessori herself, she would move to a neighboring space where she would use what she called a whispering voice in order to call the children one by one by their names, Rosa, Philip, Mohammed, Cornel, or Peter. Once a child heard its name, it was allowed to stand up and to move 
as silently as possible towards Maria Montessori in the other room. It was very important that the child moved silently because it could not disturb the silence that reigned in the classroom. What was important for Maria Montessori is that the children learned how to move in a silent way, how to move in a coordinated way, how they could use their muscles in order to become active without disturbing the other children. In other words, what she wanted to do is to prepare by means of those silent exercises the children for a life in a accelerated society. And that discovery kind of disturbed me. It made me doubt whether I still had to love silence. Because what attracted me in being silent, in becoming silent, in turning silent, was precisely the fact that it enabled me to slow down my own life. And so this stood in shrill contrast with the ideas that Maria Montessori had about being silent. So do I still love silence after this discovery of Montessori's silent exercises? Yes, but only when it is used to slow down only when it reminds us of the etymological origins of the word silence. The etymological origins of the word silence that refer to this wonderful Gothic verb, anasilam, which literally means a wind dying down. Thank you very much for your attention.